Welcome back to the second part of the episode, folks. Um, got one of my friends with here that's been on the show before, and we haven't talked to him for quite a while, and I thought it was a good time to have him back again. And uh, really excited about him making an appearance down here in the southwest, so all the folks over here on the west coast and uh, up through the mountains and whatnot that can't you know, make it together to travel quite that far can at least uh, have them somewhere near where you're at and go check them out. And best of all, of course, he's going to be hanging down there in, uh, in New Mexico with uh, Brenda Harvey-Harris and uh, and her crew down there. And I hear Cape Man's going to stop by too. So it's like all kinds of uh, Bigfoot uh, intelligentsia are going to be there all at the same time. And I want to encourage everybody that's got a chance to be there to definitely go check it out. It ain't going to cost you anything. Just get there, feed yourself, and get back again. And I think they're even going to cover part of that maybe. So, uh, man, you guys have got it made. If you're anywhere within driving distance, you want to go to that. But before I blather on any longer and bore you guys to death, let me bring on my guest and my buddy, uh, Mr. Jim Bear King. Welcome back to the show. How you doing, Hal? Oh, I'm doing great. Just been wonderful here the last few days. Temperature finally cooled down. I'm sitting outside right now. It's actually cold. Uh, why, yeah, why, well, don't you, why, why don't you FedEx some of that down here? I promise you, we need it. Well, we are not. Uh, we we aren't expecting this kind of weather this time of year. Generally, it's in the 90s or around 100, and we just got done with the, the wind switch and came out of the north. So it's bringing some nice cold air down the Rocky Mountain chain from Canada and dropping it on us, and it's not. Uh, close enough to where their fires are. We're just getting the smoke. <laughs> when we do get our smoke, it comes across the border from Idaho where they're letting everything burn down. So we've been eating uh, Idaho all summer long. <laughs> We're getting yep. kind of tired of that. Hoping it's going to rain over here and put some of these fires out. So it may be hotter down there, but, you know, maybe you're not eating forest fire smoke all day long every day either. Well, that's true. <laughs> We're fighting yeah. mosquitoes. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, yeah, I'll take the forest fires. I think you can keep the mosquitoes. <laughs> Been there before. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Mosquitoes horrible. That's the one thing you don't have to worry about around here. It's so damn dry. There's no place for them to breed. And no little yeah, but y'all have, y'all have them huge deer flies and jackass flies. I mean, they ain't even horse flies up there. They're jackass flies. Yeah. They have, they well, they go on. after the... They go after the elk, so they're used to really biggie sized critters, you know. Yeah, they That's... go after all you jackasses out there. You, <laughs> you know, I know they say that, but I don't know where these things are hiding at. They're not around here anywhere. I keep going out there without any bug repellent and never have anything to try try and chew on me that isn't, uh, you know, bigger than the size of my foot. So right. uh, I really don't have much of a, a bug problem here. We get we done exchanged our bug problem for grizzly bears and mountain lions, and uh, we, yeah. we like that trade. We'll keep the grizzlies and the mountain lions. You guys can have all the poisonous snakes and the mosquitoes down there. Man, <laughs> I hear you, bro. I hear yeah. you. it's real refreshing. You know, I've done some some uh, as you as you know, I've been around down the jungles in florida too and you know where everywhere oh, yeah. you go you got to watch where you put your foot you got to watch what's in front of you you got to watch what's hanging from the trees above you and around here you can just be a doddering idiot and you don't have to worry about any of that well, unless you fall right into the mouth of a grizzly bear you haven't got anything to worry about there aren't any poisonous snakes to step on there aren't any poisonous spiders to get you you're all good just don't get eaten by a grizz and you're fine <laughs> right <laughs> well we we figured out a long time ago i'm talking about the basics Deep South outlaws. Uh, we don't do nothing from green up until uh, the fall solstice. Uh, uh, when you know harvest, the harvest yep. moon comes up. That's yep. when we start back up. That's our season. It's always from about mid October till about mid April. Sometimes a little earlier than that. Very rarely do we get a little later than that, but it does happen. And uh, everybody, you know, I'm not saying we don't still continue investigate things, but we do a lot more of our uh, completing uh, reports and things like that during the summertime because everything is against you. I mean, the foliage. <laughs> well, it so, is. yeah, you can't see anything because it's so grown in so thick. It's hotter than hell. There's poisonous stuff everywhere. It's you know, it's way more dangerous in the summer than it is in the winter. Um, yep. So, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Well, you know, it's not only that. I mean, the insect noise is enough. You could have a critter answer you, but you don't know that you're hearing him. 
<laughs> and because all the surrounding insects and frogs and crickets and everything, you know, they're just raising ten times worth of hell. And uh, <laughs> you just don't know if you're even actually being answered. And then if you're standing right there next to a hedgerow or something, you know, that sucker could be right there and tap on your shoulder and say, hey, speak up. I can't hear you. Ask for the candy deal. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> I mean, that's how, that's how it, it, you know, you describe Florida, but, yeah, that is the jungle, but we're, we're as close to the jungle as it could possibly be. When you get yeah. a little farther north into uh, the northern border of Tennessee and Kentucky, it's not quite as bad, but it still is to a certain degree. A lot of people, you know, do most of their uh, investigations, and they call it research. I don't. You already know how I feel about all that. But yeah. uh, they do all theirs in the summertime. We mm-hmm. have our success in the winter. And uh, that's when, you know, these things become more of a meat eater. And uh, when when they eat meat, uh, you, you, the advantage is yours then. <laughs> Yeah, they can't sit in one place and graze. they got to move around to catch game. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, after you've been doing it as long as some of us have, you know, I've been doing it over 45 years actively. I knew of them a lot sooner than that, you know, when I was six years old in 1966. But uh, you turn around and uh, you figure these patterns out after a while. Uh, yeah. You're not only combating the foliage or the thickness of the uh, underbrush and everything like that. You're not combating uh, the canopy and noise the insects are playing Led Zeppelin with. But uh, <laughs> you, you, it, it ain't fun to wipe humid sweat. I know this. I, yeah. I stayed out in west, southwestern Oklahoma for a year. And out there, it's a dry heat. I'll never forget. Uh, it was in July or August when I was out there. And where I was at, there was a huge swimming pool. And I was out there in the swimming pool at from like 2 to 5 or 6 that day. And uh, Dan Ricky kept coming outside. You know, he was there too. And he say, Bear, you going to kill over with a heat stroke? I said, this ain't nothing. I said, man, <laughs> I said, he said, have you looked at the thermostat? I said, what does it say? He says, it says 118 degrees. I said, it don't feel nothing like 118 degrees. I said, exactly. come on over the, I said, come on over there to Mississippi or Alabama and, with it 90 degrees and 120% humidity. And the minute you step outside, Beads of sweat will just pop up on your arms. And even if you wipe them off, beads of sweat will follow it. Uh, That's the difference between humid heat and dry heat. Dry heat, you don't have beads of sweat pop out on the pores of your skin. There's no way your body can actively cool down with humid heat. You can't get used to it. I don't give a damn how long you work out in it. I used to build houses for a living. I did that for almost uh, 30 years, and uh, there's no way you can get to it. All you can do is stay hydrated all the time and make sure that you've got salt tablets or you uh, vinegar from uh, pickles, jars of pickles, or, or a straight-up tomato juice. You've got to supplement your body with that to replenish what you sweat out because you sweat so much. And then your clothes are soggy. And I'm talking about at midnight or <laughs> 1 or 2 in the morning. And you're yeah. wiping sweat. You, you're miserable. You you have to pant to breathe. I mean, you, you see dogs all the time with their tongue hanging down to the ground. They're panting because they get cool through their tongue, you know. And But we can't do that. No. Uh, if if I did, you know, Gene Simmons would be jealous as hell, and I'd have been married to Cher. But it didn't work <laughs> out that way. And uh, 
Well, you know, the fact of the matter is it's the same thing up here. It's, a, it's semi, it's very arid. It's really close to being a desert. We had barely enough rainfall to have forests around here. And it hits like 95 or 100 degrees, and the locals are all like, oh, my God, hell is she? And I'm out riding my bike for, you know, like 10 miles. Yeah. Like, this is awesome. This is gorgeous, man. I, I went and did like a, what was it, three-and-a-half-hour bike ride here about two weeks ago when it was 104. <laughs> and everybody else was like, what? looking at me like I'm crazy, and I'm like not even sweating, going, what's the big deal? You know, so it, yeah. it makes your skin a little bit hot. Big deal, you know. And what you're saying, I worked a couple summers outdoors in Florida doing installing trenches for putting in uh, new drops cable for a cable company. Right. And, you know, if you're digging trenches out in the yard in the middle of the summer, that's about as hot as it can get. And what you're saying is exactly true. I actually would bring an extra pair of clothes with me, and at noontime I'd change out of the soggy, filthy stuff I was wearing for morning that in four hours had become soggy and filthy. And I would put on a new set of clothes, and I had four two-liter bottles with me, soda bottles that I had re- refilled with cold water, and I'd drink two of them in the morning, and I'd drink the other two in the afternoon. So that's eight liters of water, and I guarantee you that nine out of ten times I did not take a whiz all day long. I sweat yeah, all of it back out you again. You couldn't. You can't. And, uh, you know, that ain't good for your kidneys either. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think that's why a lot of people in the South have kidney stones and kidney trouble. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah it, you never get it, enough uh, liquid built up in your body to be able to actually excrete it normally. It keeps wanting to go right. out through your pores all the time. Yeah, and I was a dumbass and was drinking Mountain Dews at the time. And every time oh, I get God. thirsty, I'll drink another damn Mountain Dew. And Mountain Dew is like an absorbent, you know. I mean, it's sodium. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was wet and cold going down, but all I was doing was just leaching what little fluid I had within my body out. Actually, yeah. over the course of the time that I was building houses in 30 years, I had two what they call uh, heat strokes. And when you go down with a heat stroke, you're down for two weeks recovering because your body has to replenish everything that you leached out of it. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they they always say that whenever you have a heat stroke, you're actually taking five years off your lifespan. And I figured that out. I I really think, and I know that people want to hear about Bigfoot, but – uh. We'll be on it in a second, folks. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there in a roundabout sort of way. But I think that's why Southern-based football teams are more successful at more times than other teams from across the country because they do two-a-days in this crap. And if you can survive one one, one practice in the morning without two of them and you can survive that, you're either a hell of a man and you've got gas in the tank when it counts during bowl season, you know, during December and January. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really think that, you know, and if anybody listening, a uh, college coach uh, listening to this would get them uh, rent a good high school stadium or something and then have two a days down here for about two weeks, it'll make them or break them. As a player, I'm telling you. And <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's some rugged stuff there. It's to, it's tough to be able to, to you know tough it through that and still keep going. And like you're saying, it's it's the truth too, though. If you can do that, playing one regular game and going full out is like no big deal. Right, right. But you know, it, it's going to be this way in the South till about mid October. Uh, mm-hmm. Usually it's always about two weeks before Halloween when things starts cooling down. That's when the trees, uh, the leaves off the trees start falling too, you know, and uh, that's when activity starts really amping up with in with Bigfoot, especially in the South. Uh, I'm not saying that he doesn't continuously do what he does all summer. I know he does. I mean, it ain't like he takes a vacation and jumps on one of those Norwegian cruise lines, you know, and go yeah. where it's cool. Uh, but everything is against you in the South during the summer. And I know that there's people who just have to get out there. They have to get – and every time they call me up, do you want to go? Do you want to go? I said, hell no. Go ahead. Have a good time. But also remember when you come back home, I'm going to look at you and say, I told you so. And mm-hmm. every one of I, I mean, people try to get recordings down here. And 
in the summertime. And, and they may even be hearing good recordings, but hell, when you're trying to bleed out all of the insect noise, you really just wasting your time because I, I, I've never heard of a good recording made in the summertime in the South. Never have. Yeah. You know, and that brings me to another thing that, that's always kind of interested me that I'd like to pick your brain on here for a second that doesn't get talked about a whole lot. And in as much as we know they're being seen less in the summer and, you know, some say it attributed to them moving around less and others will just attribute it to there's tons more cover. <laughs> so it's a hell of oh, yeah. a lot harder to see one. But, you know, and, and it could be the in-between part there too where there's more veggies available so they can just take advantage of that and don't have to be running around trying to catch things to eat. But what, what in the hell are these poor things doing during the summer when it's that hot? They're walking around wearing this fur coat all the time. <laughs> you I know, I mean, it's like walking mainly... around with a jacket on. <laughs> In the summertime, the <clears throat> I know this. My granddaddy showed me this. We'd be out there hoeing cotton or corn or uh, speckled peas or black-eyed peas in the a field, and me and my brother would be out there, and most of the time we'd take our shirts off. I mean, hell, if you're going to be out there in it, might as well work on that farmer's tan. But my granddaddy, my granddaddy would always wear... Not only a long sleeve shirt, he'd wear a damn T-shirt underneath it. And I'm talking about 100-degree weather. Good God. And, well, I asked him. I said, what's the purpose of that? He said, actually, your body is cooler. Mm. I said, how? I said, you're, you're making me just smother watching you wear that long sleeve shirt and knowing you got that T-shirt underneath it. He said, because it gets saturated with sweat. And then what little breeze, if one even kicks up, it, it chills your body to the core. Mm-hmm. And it kind of keeps you cooler. <laughs> and I'm saying, no way in hell. No way in hell. But once you logically look at it from an angle, because, you know, a lot of them old-time farmers are tough codgers now, and yeah. uh, ranchers or whatever, and they... They wouldn't be doing that if there wasn't any uh, logic to it. Right. I'm thinking, uh, you know, I've done most of my research in the deep south. The farthest west I've ever done it up until I'm heading out to New Mexico on this deal uh, at, with Brenda Harvey Harris and her conference out there in farming in New Mexico. Uh, the closest I've ever been out that way was southwest Oklahoma. And, you know, I have researched some in the eastern part of Texas, especially if you run a line straight down from Oklahoma City through Dallas, anything back east, I've worked that pretty good. And uh, I know that from everything I've seen, including good pictures of these things that a lot of people scoff at and say, well, that's just another blog squatch. But first, you got to know what you're looking at. Second, you got to know how to look at it. And third, I, I, and I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with untrained eyes. There actually is. If you've seen enough of these things in their natural state, in their natural environment with the naked eye, you can have some success in picking some of them out in these photos. Of course, people turn around and want to find find more than the one they want to find the baby on the right shoulder and the cousin over there in the top of that tree and i've even seen people circle blog squatches on damn uh state park signs i mean um, (laughs) but you know that's not where i'm getting at what my i'm trying to come to is this The photos I've seen from the Pacific Northwest, even in the mountains, even the ones in uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Maine, other northern climates, the hair on those boogers in those parts of the country are not as shaggy as they are in the south. Mm -hmm. And there may be several reasons for it, and I could probably take up a whole show on just the reasons alone. I know that... uh, One of them may be to retain the moisture underneath the hair. You know, I'm talking about on the skin itself. It may even allude back to what I described earlier about my grandfather wearing that long sleeve. And he'd have both sleeves buttoned. I mean, he wouldn't have them rolled up or nothing. 
um, <laughs> with that T-shirt underneath it. I think it also, you know, it, it makes them cooler. I know that it's longer hair in the South for camouflage purposes because in the South we have a lot more evergreen-type trees. Uh, mm-hmm. When one gets stoops down on his haunches or is on an all four position, you can glance at it, especially if it's a older, mature one that has what everybody calls a sagittal crest or, you know, the pointed type uh, on top of their head. Yeah. It, if you take a quick glance at it, especially under early morning light conditions or late evening, if they and they can remain still if they choose to. <clears throat> They're very stealthy. But they can fool you into thinking you're looking at a cedar tree or a pine tree. And I've yeah. seen cedar trees and pine trees actually move. <laughs> yeah, now. but they don't. <laughs> yeah, because when there's no, trees, no. they actually have to move. Well, that's why mm-hmm. I think the ones that are more, you know, I had one try and pretend he was a stump with me, and uh, when I realized he wasn't a stump, he gave me quite the stink eye. But I think, you know, that's why uh, they like to hide, like, in the shade underneath, especially, like, the big uh, pine trees and stuff like that because it's cooler, and in that darkness underneath the tree, you can't make out what the hell they are unless you're right on top of them. They just well, if you can't, fade right if you in. Can't, if you catch one out in the broad open anyway, you caught him with his britches down because they ain't yeah. going to get out in the broad ass open unless they just absolutely have to or they don't have no other choice. Yeah. But uh, there's other reasons maybe the ones in the deep south have the longer length of body hair than other places. And and see, that in and of itself is another explanation. A lot of people call it fur. It's not fur. It's hair. Right, it's hair. Yeah, and uh, actually it's coarse hair. It's kind of like if you feel the texture of it, the closest thing I can even compare it to is horse's manes or horse's tail. Uh, yep. We've pulled samples off of barbed wire fences. A lot of people like setting up barbed wire traps to try to catch hair, but hell, all you have to do is find where you're at where they cross these barbed wire fences at because it don't make no difference. Yes, deer do jump over the fences, but if you can't tell the difference between a deer hair and a Bigfoot hair by just glancing at it or actually feeling it, you need to go back to Bigfoot 101, you know, and start all over. But, yeah, they're uh, not even remotely similar. Mm-mm, not even close, not even close. Uh then you can find where they'll straddle these taller barbed wire fences and get in. And you're going to laugh about this, but once I say it, it makes sense. <clears throat> you get that crotch hair, and I'm telling you, it's kinky. It's kinky as hell. <laughs> and uh, it, it's all matted up, too. Uh, when you got hair of that length and you wallowing around and uh, – uh, sulfur soaps or sinks or sinkholes or things like that. And see, there we go tearing off in the direction. Everybody wonder why they always smell like rotten eggs. Well, what is most commonly associated with rotten eggs? It's sulfur. Sulfur. And <clears throat> sulfur is also a very, very, very good insect repellent. I'm talking yeah. about for ticks and chiggers and mites and lice and everything else. <clears throat> and I promise you, if you've got a family troop or a unit or even Bigfoot in your area, they know where these seeps are or these places where sulfur is. And they don't have to necessarily be totally sulfur. Uh, the ones who are listening to the show, they can, if, if they have spent any time in the woods and follow a hill or a hollow or a canyon up to its source where the water comes out of the ground, <clears throat> you can follow that water source downhill and it'll run into places where the water eddies up, E-D-D-Y-S, <clears throat> because of um, limbs falling into the stream or creek or whatever. And you'll find these little spots, and they're wide little spots where it, actually it probably cuts under the underbankment, you know, in its course of ero- natural, natural erosion. Mm-hmm. And uh, these little eddies, if you'll look at them 
with the sun shining off of them, you'll see a petroleum-type substance on top of the water. And you sit there and you say, well, hell, I done followed it from its source, but why is there gas? Because that's the only way you can describe it. When You know when you pour so, uh, just a hair or a little bit of gasoline into a bucket of water, the petroleum or the gas is going to float on top. It don't sink. Yeah. And it's obvious it gives off a nice little rainbow-colored reflection. Yes, yes, yes. And you'll see that. And you say, wow, man, you know, maybe I can go up here and purchase that headwater and drill an oil well. But uh, no. (laughs) No, no, no. It's just what seeps out of the ground with the water. And, uh, of course, since this type chemical is lighter than water, it's going to come to the top, and when it comes to the top, it's going to seep out of the ground into the stream or creek or little ditch. You know, at the beginning, even the Grand Canyon starts as a little ditch somewhere, and yeah. uh, you'll follow that thing on down, and you'll see these little eddies, and some of them are pretty wide spots. And these animals, these Bigfoot, naturally find these things. And they will wallow around in it and coat their hair with it, uh, using the mud and everything else. That's why they smell so bad. I mean, everybody describes them as wet dog or bad B.O. And always you hear them talk about rotten eggs uh, or like a skunk. And actually sulfur, a lot of people, I've heard people describe when they smell a polecat, which that's what we call a skunk in the south is a polecat, they associate it with a skunky smell. That hence in Florida where the name skunk ape come from Mm because it smells like a damn skunk. And uh, Something I've had brought up a couple times by other researchers is this whole insect repellent and stink thing. And uh, some of them think that they're also using things like uh, wild garlic and skunk cabbage and things like that to just, you know, put up a reek because, uh, you know, on a less, to a lesser extent, they'll work to do the same thing. Well, what if, you, you know, if, and I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> I'm one of the first people that will tell anybody, if you want to learn what these things are consuming and utilizing in the woods, go find you a book on that location, that part of the country, and start recognizing certain things that these things will consume. And if you consume enough of anything and you sweat, and they do sweat, only you can't see the sweat because it's hidden underneath the hair. It's kind of like, you know, dogs or whatever. Uh, You're going to the, you're going to sweat out of the pores of your skin. Uh, I know that when I went and started seeing this doctor I'm seeing about four years ago, uh, I was having trouble with arthritis. And, of course, you know, they don't give you no drugs anymore because they might think you're a junkie. But uh, he put me on cod oil pills, cod oil pills. Yep. I'll never forget it. I was taking them suckers. I was taking one in the morning, one in the evening, and then one before I went to sleep. And it Jeez. wasn't a week later. We went to, we was cleaning off a, a food plot at the deer camp. And it was one of them days where it was humid as hell and a, one of them 100 degree days with 150 degree humidity, which that's an exaggeration, but it feels like it. Uh, Fish are getting confused swimming up in the midair because they think it's hot water. Well, you know, I'll tell you this. In the south, it never fails. It tickles the hell out of me. You can tell when you're talking to a foreigner or a Yankee. They'll wake up in the south, and they'll look across the field if they've got enough ground they can look across. Well, just even an average football field, you know, for uh fall training before uh, football season starts. You get up early in the morning to try to get out there to beat the heat. And you look out across there and it looks, oh, look at the mist or the fog. You ain't looking at mist or fog. You're looking at friggin' water hanging in the air, which is humidity. (laughs) Exactly. 
Yeah, when I was down in Florida, you get that every afternoon. It would cloud over and rain for about an hour between 2 and 3 o'clock. And, of course, we were in town there, so all the roads were made out of wet, nice dark asphalt. So what happens then as soon as the sun comes out and they're covered with water? Oh, the whole town turns into a steam bath. So you get to be in a steam bath every afternoon. Oh, fun. That's not fun. I was just walking around in the sun. Let's go to to Disney World. Yeah, let's go to Disney World, take our family, spend $120 each head for a ticket. And and then get in one of that water rides so we could cool off, but everybody else in the down parks in those water rides too, and so you have to wait in line for about two and a half hours, and you may have rode three rides for, uh, what, 600 bucks? Uh, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, water parks are a way better deal. They got nice ones all over the country. But I know where you're no, going with this, Bear, and it's, it's a truth with uh, with humans too that if you eat something consistently enough and you go and start sweating, the smell of that will come out in you. And I've heard he, I've smelled humans do that with garlic. They eat a couple of yes, big garlic with, meals yep, and go sweat, yep, and you can yep. smell it. And our sense yep. of smell sucks. Well, that, you know, getting back to what I was saying, we was out there in that damn food block. And I got to smelling raw, stinking-ass tuna. And I said, where in the hell is that coming from? I don't see no nasty rubbing around here. But, uh, you know, maybe that was an insult, but I didn't mean it for you. Pete. But, you know, any, anyway, <laughs> nothing smells worse than a can of tuna that's been sitting on the table for about uh, four or five hours, you know, exposed to the heat. But anyhow... Uh, Hell, I'd pick my arm up and I, I said, hell, that's me that smells like a damn fish. And what it was, it was cod. And it got to the extent it wasn't that I couldn't work anymore. I just was got to the point where I didn't like smelling myself more. I said, the hell with this. Y'all can have it. I'm going to take a shower. You know, and I threw them damn pills in the garbage can that night. I went back and seen the doctor. He said, where are you taking that? How are those pills working for you? I said, they was in the garbage can in less than two weeks. He said, why did you do that? I said, man, do you know what physical labor is outside? And, you know, he got kind of offended about it. I said, hey, when you're out there and you're taking as much dosage as you had me taking to relieve my arthritis in my damn shoulder, you smell like a damn rotten ass stinking fish. And I, yeah. <laughs> I said, cats will follow me around, man. I don't even <laughs> like damn cats. That'd be dangerous out the woods. You'd have the mountain lions trying to sneak up on you. Hey, no, you can a rotten no, fish over no, here no. somewhere. A damn mountain lion, or we call them souped up wildcats in the south. We got them bobtail bobcats, you know what I mean? And uh, you turn around, you see one of them suckers, and he got his nose stuck up in the air, and then he recognizes that it's coming off you. He says, Hell, I ain't eating Charlie over there. That dream of stinks. <laughs> But oh, even 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 with the Bigfoot, though, if, say, you start eating those wild onions or the mm-hmm. garlic or things like that, your body is going to smell about like what you're consuming because yep. it's in your system and it's going to come out the pores of your skin. And, uh, it, you know, we laugh about the humidity in the South, but th- these things have to cope with that also. I yep. do know that in the South, during the summertime, and I've learned this by sweating my ass off literally to figure it out over the many years until I come to the conclusion it's best to just keep paying that air conditioner bill and keep your mouth shut. But uh, these things are more active from about 1 to 2 in the morning just before daybreak. And, you know, in the summertime in the south, due to the daylight saving time, all that kind of crap, sun comes up pretty dang early in the morning, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, but it's cooler outside then. Uh, we've noticed that these things will stay out longer in the mornings in the summertime than they will in the wintertime. And wintertime is no problem at all. Actually, yeah. when the temperatures, the days start getting shorter, and the temperatures start getting cooler at night is when these things get frisky as all hell. And I always say the reason they, one of the main reasons is somebody turned on the air conditioner and left the song bitch on. 
You yeah. know, because we're enjoying the heck out of this compared to what we went through two weeks ago. And right. uh, it makes all the difference in the world. And you know, it if you really think about does. It, from their perspective, it may be sort of a playtime thing, too, because during the summer, the the, uh, the nights are short. And if they're going to take advantage of what cool weather there is during the day, they got a pretty short window between yep. where it's not sweltery anymore and where the sun's coming up again, where they can run around and do anything. But during the winter, they've got really long nights. They've got well, plenty of time to go forage and hunt and then screw around to the humans and, and run across the road in front of them when they're driving down the road at night or whatever. Well, else. Tap on the side know, of the house every, or whatever. Everybody that likes trolling those databases. And, you know, I, I've done my share of it over the many years, especially after I was introduced to the uh, Internet. Up until then, all I had was John Green's There's Apes Among Us, and that and my, that, and that uh, Bigfoot case book. Those were two of the best books ever written. If, you know, anybody listening, I, I always hear people all the time saying, what do you recommend to read? What do you recommend to read? I said, what you really need to read is the books that come out by these guys way before the internet. That was when yep. they really had to research. All these yep. newer books that come out nowadays is nothing but a reflection or a cheap ripoff of everybody else's book. And, uh, and, and One thing I'd like to add to that list is another one from that time period actually came out in 1961, written by Ivan T. Sanderson, the abominable yep. snowman, and yep. he does a survey of Bigfoot-type creatures all over the world, which at that time was just phenomenal. Um, yep. So really great resource there for people, too. But go ahead, well, Bear. That's why I love John Green. He did all this by his lonesome. Exactly. From way the hell up there in British Columbia. I mean, you know, he, he was collecting stories locally. And then it just expanded because word got out that he was really interested. And, you know, for those of you who understand what I'm talking about, Saga Magazine and Argosy and all those type magazines would, you know, they, they would do articles periodically on, you know, phenomena, strange phenomena. It was always competing with UFOs and a ghost and other things. And, but, John Green, word got out that he was collecting a lot of stuff from all over the country, so he just started compiling all this stuff. And then he made it into a very enjoyable read with the book, There Are Apes Among Us. And, or I may even be wrong about the title. It, I it think is. It's the Apes Among Us. Among Us that's it. That's it. But it's John Green's book. And actually, that thing is very, very rare. Uh, and Which they is should, unfortunate because it's a great yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, somebody's missing a great opportunity to reprint it. Uh, yeah. I don't know who would have the rights to do it. You know, I don't know if his widow or what, did she precede him in death or whatever. But I, I know the family ought to at least. They're sitting on a gold mine right there if they had ever reprinted. Mm -hmm. And you know, and and nothing against Meldrum, but. Dr. Grover Krantz wrote one of the best books on locomotion of a Bigfoot. Actually, Krantz was one of the first people, which they never pushed this because I read his books. He wrote two. Uh, but Krantz was one of the first old-timers. You know, I call the big four as uh, Dalhendron, Green, Peter Byrne, and Grover Krantz. Uh, Krantz was one of the first professors with a degree that even actually said that the foot, especially, you know, the, the foot is adapted to allow it to become quadrupedal, mm -hmm. you know. And, yeah. But, you know, other people come out, you know, with their own stuff and, you know, well, if it runs on all fours, then you ain't seeing a big foot. You're seeing something else. But, you know, that's bullshit. I mean, I... <laughs> I mean, really. You're going to like the uh, next show that I got coming up, Bear, because I got a witness that saw one on all fours. Thought he was mistaking it for a draft horse until he got closer. Yeah. And he was seeing this, and wait, 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 wait for it. Germany. I got you. Yeah, I got you. it scared the hell out of him. This guy was on a, on a military base where they got a tank testing or uh, training ground. 
driving around with his unit getting some training in, and this thing was just nonchalantly ambling around over by the tree line watching him. Yep. And I just said, oh, my God, you know, I, I realize there used to be reports from there and stuff, but, having, you know, this is 27 years ago, but 27 years ago there was one there, and this thing was two of the drivers in the tanks both saw the same thing at the same time. So, you know, whatever it was, they are both mistaking the same thing for something that they well, couldn't figure they, out what they that was. It, they give it a logical answer. And, you know, how many people over the decades and the centuries – Give it a logical answer because it was so mind blowing. I've always made a statement, you know, everybody always would say, you know, well, you didn't see a Bigfoot, you was looking at bears. Well let's <laughs> let's turn let's turn that around on you, Hoss. How many bears what you looking at were really bears and not Bigfoot? Yeah. I mean it, it's that. I'm telling you. Uh, these and there's limits to their size, and their shape is different and stuff too. If you see a bear on all fours, and uh, it's it's kind of flat across the back, and if you see a bigfoot on all fours, it tends to be up higher in the front than it yep. is in the back. And yep. you've got the bear ears sticking out, and it's wider across the back than a bear well, is, and the legs look different. There's a whole bunch of things that look different, and that's why I, this has blown this guy's mind, and he was never going to tell anybody about this or even mention yeah. it. And then one of the other drivers mentioned that he had seen the same thing at the same time, and he went, oh, my God, I wasn't hallucinating this. And then to take it even further than that, he was never going to come forward with his story until somebody who listens to my show contacted him and went, hey, I know somebody that would listen to your story because they believe that there were and may still be Bigfoot in parts of Europe. And he went, no way. And he said, yeah, yeah, go go talk to this guy. He'll listen to your story. Well, another big misconception. See, there we go tearing off in all the directions. You remember when we started this show? The yeah, first yeah. thing you said was, what do you want to talk about, you know, other than the conference? And we hadn't even mentioned that yet. But I said, all you got to do is just start the record to play it, and I promise you it didn't go. And, uh, but here's another thing that I haven't really spoken that much of. A lot of people, you know, in the descriptions you always hear of, I'm talking about them when they're bipedal on two legs, standing as upright as they can. One thing mm-hmm. people need to understand, these things do not lock their knees like humans do. I'm talking about like 10 hut, you know, when you're in the tension. You lock yep. your damn knees. If your knees are even halfway unlocked, you're not at a tension, and that damn CO or that master sergeant walk up there whop you upside the head. But yep. uh, these it seems things, like they literally can't do that. Even if they're standing in one place, they don't seem like they can walk their knees. Well, they're always see, bent that, a little bit. That just, that just supports more of a quadrupedal position type stoop because you can more readily drop into a quadrupedal position from that angle. But my point yep. was this, and let me finish it, and then you tear into it because <laughs> you probably <laughs> already <laughs> thought of it. Well, everybody always says their arms look longer than their legs, even though their legs are exceptionally long. But what other description do you get? You don't see no neck. The reason mm-hmm. you don't see no neck is because their shoulders are slumped forward, forward. Now, yep. if this thing stood up at a tension like a, a buck private soldier, you know, and was able to lock his knees and throw his shoulders back, I promise you that those arms that almost look like they're about to touch the knees are come up about the same distance on between the knee and the hip as a human. And... uh that slumped over position that they assume naturally or through evolution or whatever what caused it to be the way it is and not seeing any neck or the they they a lot of people describe it as shoulder pads or like a football player wears if this mm-hmm. thing was able to throw its chest out there and chunk its shoulders back just like a soldier at uh, attention and lock its knees what is going to happen to that length of that arm that's almost touching the side of his knee? It's going to rise up. Yeah. And uh, nobody has, you know, I haven't seen it. Uh, all I've ever seen was the slump over position, the no-locked knees, the whole nine yards. And 
I've thought about that a million times. You know, everybody says, well, his arms are longer than his legs. Uh, no, not necessarily. But, see, you hit on that when you said what you did about mm-hmm. when they are in a quadrupedal-type position, their knees even bend more. And when their knees bend more, that makes their hindquarters lower. And then yeah. when they're running along, and here's another misconception everybody talks about. They think they place the palms of the hands flat on the ground. No, they don't. They are knuckle walkers. Yep, just like they gorillas walk. and chimps. Knuckle just walking. like gorillas and orangutans and chimps. Just yeah. like them. And of the only part of the foot, and there's another misconception, um, their foot does not remain flat on the ground. Actually, that's where that mid-tarsal break that so many people love screaming about, <laughs> and they, they well, they claim that it's only for uh, pulling grades or elevations on side of hills. But if they drop into a quad position on all fours, the heel is going to rise up naturally like a woman wearing high heel shoes. And that mid tarsal break comes into play then because guess what part of the foot is only on the ground? The front pad of the damn foot. Yeah. So it's from the tip of the toes to the mid-tarsal break that's actually contacting the ground. Yes. And uh, these things will walk almost subconsciously. It's not that they do it on purpose. But when they strike in the ground with those knuckles, and it depends on how soft the ground is, you're normally going to have three knuckle prints. Your Mm -hmm. pinky and your thumb will not hit the ground unless they're in mud or in soft conditions. And when that hits the ground, that foot on the same side, like say your right knuckle hits the ground, the right front pad of the foot's going to come forward and either step almost into those knuckles or it's going to step behind it. And it gives the impression of a three-toed friggin' track. (laughs) <laughs> Bravo, Bear. Thanks for explaining that one. There's lots of people that get, that get confused by that one. Well, you know, they want to say, Oop, I got a special booger. He's only got three friggin' toes. Y'all, you got an <laughs> emu out there that's lost. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> yeah, one of the farmer's uh, landmine traps worked and took some toes off. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm not saying that these things do not have accidents. I mean, when you walk around barefooted all the damn time and the way they hang around railroad tracks, a lot of people wonder about that one. I'll tell you what that one is. Go and pick up one of those ballast rocks off of a damn railroad track and lick it after you've done cleaned the bird crap off of it and everything. Just lick it. What are you going to taste? Uh, rock. Salt. Salt. Okay. Meat eaters got to have salt. Yep. Uh, that, that's why they hang around old mines. Uh, what, what do y'all call it when you find these old mines and they dig it out and they pull all the ballast off to the side? They got a word for it out there. What is it? Uh, Those are slag heaps. Slag heaps. Then you, then people sit around and they say, well, why in the hell do they hang around cemeteries or graveyards? And it ain't because only the salt, because you got to dig that grave so many feet deep. Everybody says it's got to be six feet deep. No, it's just got to be deep enough to put the vault in or to lower a casket in. Usually most grave diggers cheat, and you might have one that's five feet deep, and you're lucky. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, and, well, as far as that goes, back other, in the olden days before we had organized cemeteries and stuff out here. If somebody died out on the prairie, they just dig a shallow pit, they put you in it, and they cover it up with rocks so that the well, big predators don't pull you out. know, I mean, that's what I keep telling my wife. I laugh at her. I said, why do you got to go through all the expense? I mean, all a mortician is a con artist. So he wants you to send your ass to the pearly gates in the best vault money can buy, of uh, the most expensive damn coffin you can buy, what in the hell difference to uh, dust to dust, ashes to ashes? I mean, I just explained the way uh, burying somebody and cremating them all in the same breath. Uh, there you go. 
I mean, let me you add know, another one there. For what they pay for a burial, for what they pay for a coffin, for what they pay for all of the funeral expenses and everything, you can make a small size Viking ship and just have old traditional style funeral. There you and go. Get, go lay your corpse out on there, push it on the lake, and burn it. Yep. <laughs> I, can call burial it. All at once. I, I know that. I know that you love the one that you're putting in the ground, but hell. That person that's gone in the ground has done, its conscience has done already gone away. And they could care less where you put them. Just don't dig a hole in your basement or bust open a wall to hide them inside. After a while, they start stinking. Make sure that you put, dig a hole deep enough in your basement that you can pour concrete over it and hope like hell nobody ever has any reason to jackhammer it. Or if you're in northern Minnesota and you really do want to keep them around preserved and don't have the money for it, go bury them in a peat bog for a while. That'll mama file. There you go. There you go. And I know there's going to be people insulted listening to this, but listen, people, the person that's gone on to their just reward could care less. <laughs> and, and, yeah, what are you doing feeling insulted listening to my show, for God's sake? This is my show, for God's sake. <laughs> this isn't like one of those normal polite shows. You're listening to the Duke, and he's got bear on here, so what do you guys expect? Well, anyway, yeah, that's yeah, true. Like, you got a duke and a bear. And, 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 and. <laughs> I told Brenda when I had her on the show, the show earlier that uh, you had, uh, you since you had gone and promoted her to uh, the queen of the Bigfooting world, that I would follow suit and also well, designate her as such. So name, <laughs> name, a, name a female out there today, uh, and I'm saying today, name a female. I'll be honest with you. Bobby Short, in my mind, at one time was the queen of the Bigfoot world. Me and Bobby were friends. I never met the woman. I wished I could have. We would have some of the most interesting conversations. She would cuss me, tell me I was crazy as hell, the whole nine yards. And I'm saying, hey, Bobby, Bobby, wait a minute. I done seen this. I said, have you seen this? No, I ain't seen it, but you're still crazy as hell. I said, okay, I'll take the crazy part, but I've seen this. You know, I wouldn't be telling you. And, uh. I loved her to death, and I missed the hell out of Bobby Short. Before her, though, there was a little old lady in Tennessee, and her name was Mary Green. I considered Mary Green the queen of the Bigfoot community. And uh, then Mary's health got real bad. And I still, when I would talk to her, you know, after everything started going downhill for her, I still considered her the queen of the Bigfoot world. Bobby Short was. Uh, Today, I mean, I know there's a lot of women out there that go out in the woods. I know this, but and isn't that I wonderful really, that there actually are women researchers out there at this point doing this stuff? I mean, I love the hell out of that. Go, well, ladies, I love go. that women go out there and do this. The ones I don't like is is the ones that their hair's got to be in place, every lick of makeup's got to be on spot, their camo shirt's got to fit in with that nice camo ass that they're wearing, you know, with those britches. They got to look good for the camera. And, uh, I, I mean, really, really. I, I mean, I'm not insulting nobody here. Is this a photo op, or are you serious about what you're doing? And, uh, you know, I, I don't have a problem with them if they're doing it for the right reasons, but if they parlay their popularity because you got a lonely, a bunch of lonely old rotten men out there who see a good-looking woman on a Bigfoot uh, page or doing a radio show or whatever, they don't give a damn what that woman has to talk about. Just stick her picture up there, and they'll be happy as hell. I promise you. <laughs> Yeah, if it's near a Bigfoot track or a stick structure, it's like even just as good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I you know, I am nothing to brag about. I'll tell you this. I'm bald-headed. I'm getting old. I've let things go south, but hell, that's all part of getting old. I'm slower than I used to be, and I damn sure ain't going to run no more. Uh, so y'all don't even have to worry about tripping nobody because I ain't going to run. And yeah. uh, I can't, you know, but my deal is if you're going to be out there and put yourself into the public, you better get ready for the criticism. 
Yes, yep. a lot of lonely and and if half of these women researchers would look around and notice. The ones that always are texting them, emailing them, and then talking to them are all lonely heart club, horny son of a bitch. <laughs> and I'm not being ugly here. I'm just telling it like it is. I've always said research the researchers, and then you might figure out why you're so damn popular. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, Barry, humans are going to be humans, whether they're in big footing or high finance or whatever they're doing. That's that's just the way they I are. I don't give a damn what a person looks like. I don't care how big they are, how skinny they are. If they're out there and they want to do this thing the right way, they've got my respect. I don't care if they're yeah. male, female, what race, what gender. It don't make a damn to me. Don't sit there and become a critical judge, because I'll tell you this. There are no judges out there who know enough about this damn thing that they can point fingers at other people and say, you're lying, you're hoaxing, and you are doing wrong. Now, who yeah. in the hell out there has that kind of credentials that they can point fingers at anybody? Well, nobody. And the other thing is, Bear, like I, I'm fond of pointing out, and you've said before, too, you know, anybody that's running around calling themselves a damn expert on this is, is full of crap. And, in fact, it, it goes even one step beyond that. If, if you assume that you are the expert, that means you think you know everything there is to know about it, and therefore you're not going to listen to what anybody else has to say anymore because you already know all. So well, how could anybody I, I, know something I, that you don't know? And that's the problem with this community. There's a bunch of people out there that are, you know, supposedly top dogs and have real big attitudes and egos about how they know everything to the point where they won't listen to what anybody has to say anymore. And they're missing well, they a lot of the pictures. they don't need us, man. They don't need us, so why in the hell are they listening to our show? And I promise exactly. you, they're listening to our show, but it ain't under their name. I know that much. It's mighty damn funny when you have a TV show on TV and we can do a radio show on something and then the next season of that TV show pops up and all of a sudden they're talking about things that I know we covered on the radio show uh, six months before. Mm -hmm. I mean, that shows me they're grasping. Can I prove it? No. But I got sense enough to know if you've been on the air for four or five seasons and then all of a sudden you're going to dig something out of the damn uh, woodshed or that uh, chest of drawer that you got all your secrets hid in, it's mighty damn funny that somebody did a radio show on it six to eight months before you decided to film one. <laughs> I mean, I may, I, may have that, fell, <laughs> I may have fell off the damn tater truck, but I didn't fall off that son of a bitch yesterday. And get you know, run over by it. Yes. <laughs> Even though they're trying to run over your ass so you can shut up. And then You're they can the actually, way. yeah, then they can actually claim the credit for it, you know? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> well, just what I think is funny, Bear, is that there's so, so many shows out there, but there's so few of them that seem to have the balls to just go ahead and do whatever it is that they want and not be worried about what everybody else is saying. They and, you know, this just kind of happened, uh, I want to I wanna point something out if anybody has never noticed this, but you've noticed this, and you you, you you pretty sharp cookie. We got castrated back in the day about these things running around on all fours. Now, it's, you know, everybody's talking about it, including the ones who used to swear up and down that we didn't know what the hell we was talking about. We got right. castrated about the damn fact they climbed trees, even then now everybody's more leaning that way. Which, that brings up awareness to this new breed that's coming up, and they're listening to all these shows, and I hope they're really paying attention. Uh, I'll say this for Yeah, some of them will hopefully look up when they're walking around in the woods. That'll help a lot. Well, nowadays, you know, the major problem we always had was people we'd take into the woods who ain't never been in the woods in their life. They can't keep their damn head uh, pointed straight ahead to save their life because a damn uh, bird will chirp over here or a damn squirrel will <laughs> knock a limb over here and their damn head's on a damn swivel and y'all you're doing is pissing in the wind because every booger in the country I mean your ambiance your whole uh, mood when you walk into that woods is nothing but a stress attack yeah. and every, every you're not animal, used to it yeah, well, every animal out there ain't used to it either, and they're catching on to the vibes, and they're 
the Blue Jays over here raising hell, the Magpies over here raising hell, the squirrels are barking at you, and every damn Bigfoot two ridges over is sitting over there snickering. They said, "Uh huh, boy, they being real stealthy." But uh, yeah, Bigfoot's point, going, "Hey, there's people over there, and there's city people yeah. too. Do you hear the squirrel laughing at them?" <laughs> the hell, don't you smell that song, bitch? That smells like codfish oil. What's codfish oil? The one that smells like friggin' tuna. But uh. Yeah, go get Cousin Hawk. He didn't get enough fish out of the river last night. I damn think he's still right. hungry. <laughs> there you go. It damn sure ain't salmon or trout, I'll tell you that. It sure smells stanky like fish, though, I promise you. But my point, the point I was getting to was, just in recent years, when we first started doing the Bigfoot Outlaw radio show, not the second time we've returned back you know i'm talking about when we brought it back in 2007 or 8 that's when we got not brave i wouldn't say it brave and it wasn't on my part because i could never explain it i always knew something was emitted to cause people to have anxiety and get sick and things like that kumbo due to his uh experiments you know through nasa and other uh major federal scientific re- labs and things, first mention infrasound. And if you'll notice, in the last four or five years, infrasound has been discussed so much that nobody, if you walked up to the average person, and I'm not talking about your Bigfoot Outlaw fan or nothing like that, and just said something about infrasound, they couldn't tell you where that originated from. And, you know, and it originated from Kumbo. You know, he was able to take what he did in a laboratory and apply it out there, and, and everything's logical sense. You know, even when we're making recordings, your recorder can only pick up what humans can hear. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those recordings, we already know, and I, what taught me this was listening to the insect light life like you flip a switch even though matt says well they can walk up there and cause that to happen well i've walked through the damn woods a bunch of damn times and them damn insects didn't quit but when you come up when you come up to somebody not with an attitude per se but come up to their stealthy you're slipping and you're sneaking and then you're communicating say in a frequency either above or below human hearing frequencies and you start jammering it away. And, you know, even being ignorant country boy like I am, at least I looked it up one time. The only uh, sound range that insects can hear in is the ultrasonic range, not the infrasonic. And, right. you know, infra means the upper levels, whereas ultra is below. And yep. uh, I'm thinking that their frequency, their, when they communicate with each other, even the ones that we catch recording when they're oh, yeah. sound like the Tasmanian devil or something, you know, because we've got mm. recordings of that. But see, that's catching them when, you know, you, you're lucky enough that they're communicating with each other in a uh, frequency range that you can physically hear and record. I believe when they're totally stealthy, though, in their own way and they're whispering to each other or whatever, um, insects hear it because they'll turn off just like you hit a light switch and uh, I also believe they can get above that's why dogs I mean people who live out in the country dogs start raising 10 times worth of hell they're mighty brave some of the guns when they can hear something at a distance but when those dogs just abruptly stop barking and raising hell protecting its already established territory which is normally the circumference of a yard when them things get close enough them big bad brave ass dogs start whimpering and start whining and start tucking them tails between them back legs and start heading to the house to crawl up under it or wanting inside or whatever that's when them things are right up on you now if the dogs can hear you and we already know that dogs can communicate with each other but they can communicate with each other in frequencies that we can't see are here, and they, they, or yeah, and they can hear in a range that we can't hear in, and the perfect example of that is a dog whistle. 
blow on the dog yes. whistle. Do we hear it? No. Does the dog hear it? Oh, well, yeah. And yeah. before you go any further, Bear, I want to back you up on this because you first broached the subject with me, oh, hell, a year and a half, out, two years ago. I think we were on some sub, uh, a similar subject. You brought it up. And I went, you know, that's really interesting. I think you're onto something. I'm going to look into that some more. Well, as it turned out, somebody that was a guest uh, with the Big Thicket guys went down there, and he took some recording equipment with him, sophisticated stuff that records above and below the range of human hearing. And he took the sound files back with him. He was recording it while they were listening to, to Bigfoot vocalizations. And guess what, Bear? Both above and below the human huh. range. So according to his data, you're absolutely right. They can probably uh, not only broadcast but receive in that range as well. And if you want all the bugs to shut up, you make a noise in that range and they hear it. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. well, you know, when you hunt all the time, and I ain't never professed to be in the sharpest cookie in the damn bag, but uh, you, you you pay attention to your surroundings. You pay attention to everything, especially if you're sitting in a stand or in a deer blind. I, I mean, everybody always asks me, why do you know the things you know? I said, from honey. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, how, well, you mean you've been hunting Bigfoot? No, I'm yeah. talking about hunting other game. I mean, you know, I'm out there in this thing's living room, only it's my uh, hunting lease. But in mm-hmm. his opinion, this is his yard, you know, this is his living room. And uh, you, you, you sitting there just trying to do everything you can to take your mind off that you're freezing your cojones off or you're bored stiff and all these mosquitoes are whining around in your ear and you you don't want to be slapping around at it because they'll spot movement and i'm talking about the deer i ain't talking about the boogers but uh you know and i'll sit there and i've solved in my mind most of the things i've learned just sitting on deer stands and then uh blinds on the ground uh, you've got time to think about it. Then when, once you've seen one or two or three or however many, you know, uh, if you ever see one, you can't never unsee it. And yeah. that's what always has tickled the hell out of me, all these quote-unquote experts and judges that I've run into over the years, especially since 1999, but no longer do Bigfoot. And everybody say, well, where's old so-and-so at? He used to be around, and he was a royal pain in my ass. And then somebody (laughs) will say, well, he just walked away from it. Well, when I hear that they just walked away from it, that tells me better than anything that they never seen one to begin with. And here they was being so critical of everybody because you can't unsee what you saw and then recognize instead of making it that bear we was talking about earlier or that draft horse or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, once you realize what you actually did see, even if you've only had one sighting, it I can promise you this, out of a week's worth of sleep, you're going to think about it before you close your eyes at night at least four to five times out of a week. Mm-hmm. And you're going to find moments where you've got time for yourself and you ain't, well, if you're sitting in the doctor's office waiting on the doctor to call you and you ain't got nothing to read, well, your mind's going to blink about. I mean, if you've ever seen one and really seen the real deal, you cannot just walk away from it. Now, you can walk away from the headache part of it, but there's no way that you can physically give it up after you've seen what you've really seen. No, I can, you may not I be a public figure, but you're still going to be looking into it. You're still going to be interested in it. Well, hell, your whole perception of, say you've seen one today. Tomorrow you'll go back to that same spot and everything is different. And I, and, and people listening are going to say, well, what do you mean different? Uh, the trees changed or moved over, those cedar trees moved around? No, that ain't what I'm saying. Once you realize that they realize you're there and you realize that they're real, your whole perception of the way you felt about going into the forest or the woods or to a park, a national forest or a park. I ain't talking about the park down the street surrounded by 20 different suburbs. I'm talking about the ones out in the woods will change. A lot of people, a lot of hunters, very good hunters, 
for years and years that there was some, something out there in them there woods like a Bigfoot. I'd already know about it. Then they actually <laughs> see one. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I would guesstimate seven out of ten hunters do not, they'll put the gun in the gun rack and never go back out there, which is the yep. worst thing they could ever do. They're they're uh, depriving themselves of something they love to do. If you know and notice and see one in its natural environment, don't let it get the best of you. Because if it wanted to eat you, I promise you, you'd done already been it, and you wouldn't have the time to sit there and think about it. Nope. What you do is what my granddaddy taught me. Learn everything you can about this thing so it ain't a shock no more and it don't surprise you. And that's yeah. why I do what I do, and I love doing what I'm doing. <laughs> Well, you know, that's why I did it for years and years and years and had no uh, connection to the public at all either because I was interested in the subject, but I was not interested in dealing with hoaxers and lunatics. And, well, you know, there's a hell of a lot have. of nice people in this community, well, but there's hoaxers and lunatics, and they're going to be well, part of any I, community. I'm, I'm going to get into that one. I mean, you know, I said a while ago when I was cussing all these people who are judging people. Mm-hmm. If a person knows a Bigfoot for what a Bigfoot really is, and they can't tell that somebody's pulling their leg, or let's just say it the way it is, talking full of shit because they want to be noticed and be noticed within the community or to get into the limelight, or and then they start singing Kumbaya and start feeding these things, the whole oh, nine geez. yards. Uh, I mean, you've got that angle, too. All they're looking for because... And every one of them, here's what tickles the hell out of me. Every one of these type people, you'll ask them, well, why are you doing this? Just to help them. Well, if you're just helping them, why are your name uh, uh, Princess Will, uh, uh, Weeping Willow over here on this website helping everybody else do it the whole damn wrong way, but yet, you're just helping them. So how in the hell are you helping them by focusing all the attention on you because now you're special? Yeah. So, see, you're, you're, you're actually speaking out of both sides of your mouth and making yourself look like a complete damn idiot. Mm-hmm. And uh, if, you, if you were sincere about helping the Bigfoot or the forest people, I, I mean, special, the word special has become so, that's, that's an ugly word to me. I mean, I hate reading the word, hearing the word, or anything else because, and that's what it's all about. I'm special. I, yeah. I'm, I've seen one, so I'm special. Look at me. Look at me. And then you get these other people, you know, and they sit there. Oh, thank goodness, you know, they they saw that you have a a great heart and that they can feel safe and confident around you and all it is is a damn circle jerk club, a bunch of mon- bunch of lonely ass people who ain't got time to go out there and figure this damn thing out the right way on their own. Because if you was really trying to help something, you wouldn't be making and putting yourself out in the forefront so everybody look at me, I'm special. And yeah. and then they well, call don't them get what I don't get there is how they think they're helping them because they don't need your damn help. They're doing just no. fine on their own. There's probably that's more of them now than there was 30 years ago. That's the most disrespectful thing you can do in nature. I've known people who would find, well, you know, you bush hog in your pasture. You own your tractor. Mama, the doe, the female deer doesn't run off. You see her when she jumps up and takes off. So here you are cutting all this sage down, you know, bundling it up. And then you look over there before you go right where mama was laying down and you see these little brown thing with white spots on it. It's a baby fawn. Mm-hmm. Let me jump off this tractor and catch that baby fawn that can't even stand up on its own two legs and I'll take it home. And there's a doe over there in the edge of them woods crying. I mean, in its own fashion, its own way, it's grieving. Yeah. And here you go, and you're going to pick that baby deer up. And I'll even go uh, smaller than that. Same thing happened with rabbits all the time. Yeah. Then uh, me and my wife was talking about this last night. Uh, 
my father and my granddaddy loved to coon hunt or raccoon hunt. And they'll, you know, shoot a coon down out of a tree or whatever. And uh, sometimes they crawl up in there where, you know, in the trunk of a tree and they'd hear this mewing sound and it'd be all these you know, you know, infant uh, raccoons. And so they'll grab one of those baby raccoons, put it in their pockets, you know, and take it home with you. And you're going to raise that raccoon or squirrel or rabbit or whatever. Shoot, you raise a damn raccoon and turn him loose in your house. I promise you, you'll be paying somebody to come take that son of a bitch off. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, leave it in your house when it's getting about six, seven months old and then come into your house. It has an opposable thumb. And it'll and open every smart. damn yes. <laughs> it'll open every damn cabinet in your house. Throw everything everywhere. Tear up clothes, tiles, sheets, pillows. And and if that son of a gun just decides it wants to bite your ass, you'll know it too. You <laughs> be done went out there in the yard and found a boat paddle to beat the hell out of it just to get him to turn loose. I mean. And and then you're going to take it out on the raccoon? No. I mean, who caused this to happen? And then you're going to sit there and say, well, I don't know why that raccoon decided to be a friggin' raccoon. <laughs> I yeah. mean, damn. The same way with baby squirrels, the same way with rabbits. Normally a rabbit, sometimes you can catch a rabbit even when it's older. And that sucker, his heart is beating so fast. And I've known them to just will themselves into having a heart attack or to die right there on the spot. Now, whose fault was that? Was that the rabbit's? No. He's just trying to be a damn rabbit. And now you're going to set the, let, let's graduate to bear cubs and everything. How many people you ever known to raise elk from a calf? <laughs> no one. All right, but they'll raise a white-tailed deer as a yeah. fawn. But why won't they raise a damn baby elk? All right. Yeah. Keep well, let's here, go you on. Know, let me qualify that. I know two people that actually have elk farms, and they started out with adult adult. Well, elk. they're that's habituated elk that has been all their life is they know that enclosed farm. <laughs> yep. And it takes a really big fence is, to you know, keep men too, by the way. <laughs> Well, you know, I watched somebody one time. I I seen a documentary. I don't forget what it was about, but they had raised a pair of phones because their mother had done been run over on a highway, and there mm-hmm. the two phones was running all around, running all around. Well, they picked the phones up, bottle fed it for years, took it to the house. One of them was a, ended up being a button buck, and the other one was a female. Then. But just naturally started growing up to be a book and wanting to do what mature books do and all that. You know, remember I talked about the little people humping on your leg? You don't want a <laughs> book humping on your leg either. But uh, then, okay, I'm going to do the benevolent thing. And so they take, you know, chances are the benevolent thing is that the local wildlife and game management found out that you've got a wild animal that you're trying to raise. And then they come up to your house and say, hey, you can't do this. You know, you got to turn this thing loose. And yeah. then they'll make a big deal out of it. Oh, I'm doing the right thing. I'm going to turn it loose in the wild. And you go out there into the wild and then you turn them loose and you nudge them out of the cage or take the uh, collar off the neck with the uh, leash that you had holding them. Go ahead, go ahead, go out yonder. And I think they even put game camera, I mean, tracking collars on them so they can kind of keep up with them for a little while. Neither one of them survived two days because of predation. I think a bear got one and a damn uh, big cat got the other one. And boy, then they pissed off at the bear and then they're pissed off at the damn big cat. (laughs) No. Now, who killed those two fawns that grew up to be deer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. I don't want to waste my time on that one. If people, you know, as I said a while ago, you got those who are who know it all that they can point fingers and judge other people. But you also got people out there that want to be special. See, we're going from one end of the spectrum to the other. 
I like it somewhere dead nuts in the middle. That's why we do the radio show that we do, Bigfoot Outlaw Radio. We're trying to help the next generation of people who want to do this, do this the correct way and the respectful way. If you ain't got time... If you ain't got time to do it the respectful and correct way, you're cheating and you're only fooling yourself. Uh, You're not going to have nothing but these moments, hey, look at me, I'm special. Or then you're going to have these moments where you don't know what the hell you're talking about because I've never seen that, I've never heard of it, and and then you come to find out the person that's doing most of that crap, the accusations and everything, ain't never seen one in the first damn place. So where in the yeah. hell have they got a, a dog to hunt, you know? Uh, well, it, they're getting it, a paycheck from the government. <laughs> well, I doubt that, too. If they are, it's a crazy check because most of these folks are so narcissistic and hung up on their own damn self and pathetic, you know, and... uh. And I'm sure a lot of people think I'm that way. Well, you have the right to judge me however you want to do, but why do I share the things that I share? And how many books do I sell? How many things have I got to go out there and make money off of? But, you know, there's not a patent on a Bigfoot's ass. So how in the hell can people go out there and charge somebody for something? Yeah, If you're gullible enough to spend that kind of money and send that kind of money to somebody to go see one, Please, please, get a hold of Brian Sullivan or get a hold of Matt Knapp or somebody I know. And I promise you, if you want to send me good money for me and you and maybe one other person, I don't want no camera crew. If you give me me and two other people, I'll do my damnedest for big money to try my damnedest to get you a Bigfoot to come up so you can see him for all of maybe 10 seconds. Yeah. And if that's worth it to you, I'll do it. But, you know, if you're going to go and pay to go out in a party of people that's 10, 15 folks at a lick and expect to see something, all you're doing is just throwing your damn money away. Might as well be in a casino doubling yeah. up. Yeah. At least when you lose it there, you know where you lost it. You you may get close enough to hear something, but you'd be lucky if you even do that. If you got a good size group with you, they're just not. Well, if you, t- I, I'll even go one further than that. Here, I'm going to take some city folk out in the woods that got more money than they got sense, and then I hear a damn fox over yonder raising ten times worth of hell, and these people ain't never heard a friggin' fox in their life. <laughs> I can get my listen. I can get my money's worth right there. You hear that? That's a damn bigfoot. Yep. Or are you stir up that possum that's on the edge of your campground or that raccoon just trying to, you know, hoping like hell that you'll settle down enough that you could go to sleep and leave a cracker or something on that picnic table over there. And then you get up to cause a call of nature. You have to go use the bathroom or something and you spook the hell out of him. And he tears off through the woods and he sounds like 10, uh, uh, troops of deer running through the woods. You can say, "There you go, Red Jones." I promise yeah, your ass. Here. I promise yeah. your ass that shit happens on some of these high dollar Bigfoot outings, and the people are so damn stupid and gullible. Well, I, I, I shouldn't say stupid. I'll say ignorant. And a lot of people get upset at the word ignorant, but if you look up the word ignorant, all it means is you don't know. It's not yeah. an insult. You can be, and, you can be uh, absolutely brilliant and still be ignorant of facts on a subject yes. because you just haven't looked at it. Yes, that. yes. And say you asked me again at the start of this show, what the hell are we going to talk about? Uh, see, this is just what happens every time. It's like, it's all bare. well, you know, anytime you want to come on the show, you're welcome to because it's like <laughs> we, don't, we don't need a topic. We can just start the show and talk for two hours easily, and almost all well, of it will be stuff that will be Bigfoot long, related. So. How long have we're you getting, been on there? We're getting you close to two. We're getting close, yeah, we're getting close to two here now, so well, we might have to wrap need, it up here pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, I, I, let, let, me, let me do what you got me on here for, even though I knew that wasn't what you really got me on here for. <laughs> But I'll do it any damn way. Uh, <laughs> go, Barry, no, go. I, I, I don't. I don't do the conference scene. But uh, not many people know this. But to our honor and our credit, you know, I was really worried about this. Uh, we we had Brenda on our 
our show several times and when we first started the show back. And uh, I knew that, and me and Brenda talk to each other quite often, either by phone or we uh, email each other or private message each other with questions of various sorts between each other. And I know for a fact that she knows what she's doing. I know for a fact that she knows what I'm doing or either we fool the hell out of each other, but it's hard to fool somebody when you've been in those situations. And yeah. it's more like a kindred spirit type deal. And I just asked the outlaws one night, I said, you know, I think she would turn me down, but what do y'all think if I offered her an invitation and if she would take us up on it to become a Bigfoot outlaw? And everybody was all for it. And I said, well, to be frank and honest, Brenda don't need us, you know, and it would be an honor if she had even considered. But when I asked her, when we, I talked to her, it was over a year ago on the phone and I and she she immediately said, oh, Bear, I would love to. I said, well, look, I don't want this to cause any friction with your own personal group because we've got other members that are outlaws that are members of other groups, too. Um, yeah. we, we just want what we consider, you know, for at this time, the best out there. And I'm not talking about the best uh, bullshitter or the best person to – feed a line of crap and just be seen on the conference scene. I wanted folks that actually get out in the woods and bust their ass and, you know, share everything they get with other people. And, uh, and this is no insult to any others who are actually doing this. We just haven't figured out who you are yet. So be patient. And if you ever get the phone call or whatever, it was all a major consensus amongst the Bigfoot outlaws. And we're not a huge group. We keep it small because we think at times small numbers are the best to operate. And we also know that the small numbers we got are some of the what we consider the best out there. Uh, other people may not consider us that way, which they don't count in our book. So we don't really give a damn what they think. But we, we're going to take care of ourselves. But uh, anyhow... I had told Brenda last year that I was coming out there to New Mexico this year, and I was really, I was working on a, a plan. I was saving up my money, the whole nine yards, to come out there in April. And Brenda, just out of the blue one night, said, Bear, I want you to speak <clears throat> at our conference this year. And I said, well, when are you going to do it? And she told me in September, end of September, <clears throat> which the dates are going to be September 25th, 26th. It's a Friday evening, starts at 5.30. She's going to have a big bonfire the whole nine yards, and then that's well, Saturday. Well, it's yep. August, isn't it? Yeah, August. I'm glad you told me that. See how dumbass I am? I told you I was yeah. ignorant. It's Did everybody August take the to show up a month yeah. late. Can't let that yeah, happen. Yeah, I'll have them showing up at her house in September, and she'll shoot me. But, uh... <laughs> Well, if she could send them all through north, though. There's a Big Sky Bigfoot conference that same weekend, so yeah, she, she would safely get rid of them. She well, just say, oh, tell, everybody, <laughs> tell everybody you went south instead of north, and maybe you can get away with it. But, uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, it's August the 25th. Thank you, Duke, for straightening me out on that. Uh, and and it's not the date that matters to me. I, I'm going out there helping a fellow outlaw and seeing some people I've never met before, and I'm very much excited about it. She's combining it with a paranormal uh, conference. It's paranormal and Bigfoot. I told her I probably won't even show up at the paranormal end because if I can't punch it in the nose, I don't want nothing to do with it. And uh <laughs> Well, I'm just telling her the truth. I mean, you know, it's nothing against that. I don't, you know, everybody, what's that saying? I ain't afraid of no ghost. Well, Bear don't do no ghost, and he ain't going to. I mean, I ain't got time for it. Oh, that's why everybody wants to ask me these questions about these man dogs or dog men. I ain't got time for that. If yeah. I concentrate on what I'm doing, which is Bigfoot only, and that's plenty enough for me, and I can safely share the things I've learned about a Bigfoot compared to, you know, jumbling it up with other things, I'm satisfied with that. And I hope other people are satisfied with that because I promise you there's plenty of paranormal groups out there. There's plenty of dogmen groups out there. I'm mainly dealing with what was uh, cooling and uh, um Ooh, 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 clicking their teeth outside my bedroom window when I was six years old, 
and I've run into it a bunch of times since then over the years in different states, most of them centered in the South. But I told Brenda, I said, I will be more than happy to come out there and just do the conference. That way I can kill two <clears throat> deer with one stone. And since then, Kumbo <clears throat> was going to come too, but he's done already used up all of his leave time for the year. So Kumbo couldn't come. And then I got a phone call from Dan Rickey. Uh, a lot of people of the new Bigfoot Outlaw radio show don't know who Dan Rickey is, but if they'll go back through the archives and they're all on Blog Talk Radio, all you have to do is type in on the search engine Bigfoot Outlaw Radios and all the most of the episodes will show up. But if you listen to any of those old shows, Dan and Vicky were on all of them. And Dan, Dan Rickey has forgotten more than a lot of people will ever learn about a book. And Dan is also a very intelligent uh, man who can talk about Bigfoot for hours on end, just like me and Kumbo can. Actually, he comes across a hell of a lot more articulate than I do. So when Dan called me and said he was he'd like to do something like that, I jumped on it, man. I said, well, I'd love for you to come. I'll even pick you up in Tennessee and take you with me. And uh, he said he would, and so he's going to be out there with me. And right. a lot of people, I'd rather promote Dan Ricky than me. But, you know, due to the success of bringing the Bigfoot Outlaw radio show back on the air, uh, what, three years ago? I don't even, well, I think it would be three years ago this October or August. Hell, I think this is even the month we brought back. But that's neither here nor there. Well, you see how much I care about doing the damn radio show. I yeah, mean, you're like barely even paying attention to a. Oh, is it the anniversary? Oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Well, well, you also you got know, uh, Kurt Kurt Moser and uh, Mark Kurt Nimble coming Moser, out there with you too, right? Actually, actually, Kurt Moser is a protege of Dan Ricky. A lot of go. the things that Kurt has learned, and Kurt's one of the new promising. Uh, Bigfooters out there, and we're we've trained. Well, I ain't gonna say we trained him. Let's just say he's hung around us long enough that some of it, most of it, soaked off on him. And he he's a damn good investigator, and he still he he still has that spunk and drive that uh, I had thirty years ago, and I still got it. It's just that you know I'm a lot slower about it. And actually, Kirk's <laughs> older than me. I mean, everybody wants to say, well, I'm too damn old to do this. But no, once this bug bites you and then you see one and all this, all you're doing is just opening yourself up for a bunch of headache, heartache, uh, pain, stress, the whole nine yards. But when, you, when you're when a spring chicken, fresh and new into this, that's my payoff is to watch people go out there and find these things that we talk about and things that we've shared over the radio and use some of our methods and it produces results. I, I, I get more of a kick and more of a paycheck out of that than if I sold a $30 book with a $15 autograph on it. And yeah. uh, that means more to me. And Matt even asked me one time, he said, what what would you like your legacy to be you know, in the Bigfoot world or, you know, along the subject line, I said, even after I'm gone, that people will say, you know, I never would have figured half this crap out if it wasn't for a big mouth redneck from Mississippi and Alabama who uh, was stupid enough to put his neck out there on the line to tell all these damn lies that everybody calls a lie about, but yet they're using those methods to have results with. And uh, I mean, really? Uh, no, no, I, I totally gonna, agree with you. Well, I'm gonna start. Brenda told me that Dale Boswell's coming with us. He he's a songwriter and all. Uh, he he's dealt with some major artists, and he's coming with us. We're gonna have what he called a a booger tour. He he's we all. He's going to drive to my house, and he's going to follow me to Tennessee, and then we're going to Oklahoma, and we got a bookstore, the Anonymous Glenn McDonald store in Lexington, Oklahoma. Uh, it's south of Oklahoma City and actually south of Norman. 
and we're going to be there on that Wednesday, which is the 23rd. And I'm going to do two sessions, one at 12 to 3, and then I'm going to do another one from 5 to 7 or to 8 o'clock if I ain't done bored everybody to death before then. And uh, then we're going to pack up and make the haul to Farmington, New Mexico, uh, which is just 12 miles from where Brenda's holding this conference at. And uh, I'll be there that Friday night and... uh, of course, if I'm there, I'm going to be talking boogers. And uh, on Saturday, uh, as I said earlier, I, I'll probably be there to support Brenda, but I I just don't do ghosts. I don't do the paranormal. That's just not me. I'm not saying yeah. it don't happen. I just don't do it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people, when you start mixing all the paranormal aspects together then a lot of people find that reason enough to point fingers and say well you're only in this because you're into the unknown anyway no that ain't what i'm in it for mine is strictly bigfoot or what i've learned from my granddaddy to call them in the south is a booger and a lot of people make fun of boogers too you know because they say that's something that comes out of your nose well I, I know where some boogers are in Carroll County in Mississippi that I want to see you pull that son of a bitch out of your nose. But yeah, uh, one he, hell of a big nose, right? Well, <laughs> yeah. He, he, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm going to start. Brenda told me that I'm going to start uh, my, ses- uh, my speech and all at 2.30. And I can run my mouth to 5.30, which she's going to break for, uh, we call it supper in the South, but it's dinner, you know, for all y'all Yankees. And uh, she said after everybody eats or whatever, um, I can start back up again, or and I'm going to make myself available to anybody who shows up out there. And I'll ask answer any personal questions that I can and help them out and do the best I can. Uh, I'm going to be real available to the public. I'm not out. I'm going to take some five by seven pictures of myself and sign them, and I, I'm going to sell them for five dollars a piece. But the only reason I'm doing that to recoup some of my hotel expenses, my gas expenses, things like that. And you know, uh, but it it's all about the Bigfoot to me. And if yeah. you want to talk about a booger. You're going to meet an old boy in a Stetson hat wearing boots that can talk your blame ears off about it. Like I said, I ain't I ain't the sharpest cookie in the book, and I may say some things you may not like to hear, but I promise you I'm going to do my dead level best to save and reserve all them major cuss words I know for another time and the right people who need them deserve them. But uh, I, I'm... <laughs> I, I, Right on, I'm Kurt. gonna I'm gonna throw a hell and a damn in there, and they may be a song of a bitch or two, but I promise you, it wasn't done on purpose. It'd be during the heat of the the passion yeah. of the moment, I guess you'd say. And, and uh, any, anybody that doesn't know Bear well enough at, at this point, he's he's a PG talker. He doesn't throw out lots of f bombs and stuff, so you don't really have to worry about that. If you're no, easily I'm, offended by by heck and dang and and damn and maybe crap. Or something or hell or whatever. Yeah, or yeah, I'm with you. yeah. Well, yeah. you know, grow some skin. That's a little bit. Uh, you're well, an adult now. You should be able to hear words like that. But hey, Bear, I hate to cut you off, man, but we are running out of time. We got to get I going guess. here. And before we just get cut off and and the show's over. <laughs> I'm with you. But uh, thanks for cu- thanks again for coming on the show, man. I always love having you on, and you know you're welcome to come back anytime you want to. I'd like to take a minute to uh, point out that. Uh, Bear and the other Bigfoot Outlaws have a really great Facebook group called Bigfoot Outlaws Hideout. And if you're interested in learning more from them, being able to PM back and forth with them and whatnot, you definitely want to go to that. It's one of the best Bigfoot groups there is on Facebook, period. And, of course, the Bigfoot Outlaws podcast, which uh, if you're not listening to that every week, man, what what are you doing? You should be listening to that every week. Start listening to it every week. They're they're, they're, they're we accidentally give something away every week that we swear up there we ain't going to give. If everybody would archive every one of them, I promise you, there's probably five or ten or twenty books already written on just our uh, podcast. Am I wrong, 
No, not only that, I'd go one step further. I'd say you can walk into this knowing really not that much about Bigfoot and go back and listen to every show that these guys have done and go to uh, one of these conferences, and you can probably talk circles around some of these guys that are there trying to sell books. So there you go. All you got to do is tell me you want me on your show because if you say I can be on here whenever I want, you'll be running my ass off. I'll be like that. I'll be like that brother-in-law that don't know how to leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not an issue with you. You can be my co-host whenever you want to, Bear. Next time you feel like talking about boogers molesting livestock, we'll do a show about that. Well, we 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 got some major announcements that we haven't even touched on yet, man. It it's almost to that level. And when we bring them up and we decide to do it, we're we're waiting on the moments to do it. It's yep. it's not going to be earth shattering, but I promise you, it's going to make a lot of people scratch their damn heads. And there's nothing woo or majestic about it either. Uh, no, there's well, these there's guys, you know, things. one of the things I like to think about the Bigfoot Outlaws is that amongst the different uh, formats and, and uh, shows that are out there. You guys are basically the tip of the spear. You've got the most balls of almost any group out there or any broadcast out there as far as actually talking about things that people might find uncomfortable but are nonetheless true and related to Bigfoot. And, you know, some of this stuff, people just don't want to hear it, man, and you have to have the right way to approach it. I know you're running out of time. It's either we ain't got enough sense to keep our damn mouth shut or we just don't really give a damn. It's either one of those. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't be doing this show if I gave a damn what anybody thought. I guess I'm in good company. Makes sense, man. Like we said back at that first show, we all got – Hit by that cargo of uh, CIA pixie dust they were spraying the crowd oh, yeah. back in them days. Oh, yeah. So we all started hallucinating the same monster out in the woods doing the same thing all That's over it. the country. It, 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 it sunk into a lot of wombs, too, because we were <laughs> <folks over. laughs> And they were curious about Bigfoot. What the hell is this you're talking about? <laughs> That's right. Well, especially when you say boogers, they say, what's a booger? Remember what I said a while ago? That's something you pick out of your nose. Oh, you pick boogers? So you know what the hell they are, huh? <laughs> you flick them, then you got to go chasing boogers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Well, once again, thanks for coming on the show, and thanks to everybody out there for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'm absolutely sure that you did. I always love having Bear on here. And make sure to tune in next time for another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. Until then, be safe, be kind to everybody, and do not hug the Wookiee. Bye, y'all. <laughs>